even in challenging times, then be ready to step up on three fronts. First, to yourself. Bring your A-game to everything you do. It takes more effort, more work, more commitment. But when you stretch yourself and invest yourself and give it everything you've got, that's when you truly find yourself. Then be ready to step up for those you love. Make it the biggest circle you can, the family that raised you, the friends you've made and will make, the families you'll make yourselves. And finally, be ready, really ready, especially in your time, to step up for your community and your country. We are a nation of great individual stories and dreams, but our greatest story remains what we've accomplished together. We're not and have not been a perfect people, but we've struggled to do the right thing. And we've made progress. That struggle will go on in your generation. Do not be a bystander. Think of justice and what it really means. Think of this planet and the care it needs. See your fellow human beings for what they are, your brothers and sisters. And then step up to show that kind of care from the block you live on right up to the great national issues of your time. When you engage the future, your own future grows brighter. It's my honor on behalf of the Sawyer Center for Public Service, the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage, and the Watson Institute for International Studies and Brown University to welcome Tom Ashbrook. Tom before, you may hear him almost daily. Um, in fact, what, the words that I just read to you are from a commencement address that he gave last year. Um, I wanted you to hear them today because I think it explains a good deal of why Tom's here today. So why are you here, Tom? Uh, we believe at the Swear Center that powerful social change on a community and national level requires powerful stories. This fall, we are bringing radio hosts and journalists and filmmakers uh, to Brown to help students explore the intersection of storytelling, media, and social impact. We have three hands-on workshops actually coming up starting next week, um, and you can learn more about who's coming to campus and sign up uh, to attend them on our website um, at brown.edu slash go slash storytellers. But let me back up. For those of you who don't know, us at the Swear Center. Um, we've been here at Brown for 25 years. In that time, we've become the place for students to explore their passions in the classroom and in the community, while at the same time building the skills, the knowledge, and the relationships they need to make a positive difference in the world. And Brown has a very strong culture and commitment to these issues. Um, every year, our career lab does a survey for recent grads at Brown. Um, and what careers they're going into. And consistently, anywhere from a third to nearly half of our graduates go on to work in the nonprofit in the public sector, consistently. Um, and during their time, students here make a really big difference too. We have close to 700 students that participate in our community programs around Providence, and so they're spending hours each week, 700 of them, at schools, hospitals, clinics, prisons, um, and more. We have another hundred or so students that take on fellowships like the Royce Fellowship and the Social Innovation Fellowship, um, which provide them with funding and mentoring and skills to pursue their own research projects or build their own social ventures around the world. Um, and this year in our pilot TriLab uh, initiative, which stands for Teaching, Research, and Impact, we have three Brown faculty, five community professionals, and 10 undergraduate and graduates working together intensely in a year-long seminar to explore the issue of healthy early childhood development um, here in Rhode Island. So it's our hope that we'll be able to expand that initiative and involve even more students to reach even more issues in future years and future trilabs. Finally, this year we have four student storytellers who are working with us uh, in a new program. It's called Storytellers for Good. Um, these exceptional students are working collaboratively to tell brave, balanced stories um, of social impact here at Brown in order to strengthen their own skills in multimedia and storytelling and also to spark awareness, dialogue, inspiration, and connection among people and groups uh, working in social change at Brown. So they're here today and I'd actually just like to acknowledge them. Um, we have 
Hillary Brady in the front, Liza Yeager, Kareem Cathcart, and Steph Yin. Um, they're really exceptional. <laughs> so if you, any of you, have an interest in sharing a story with us, we'd love to hear it. Um, again, you can go to our website and fill us in. And with at that, uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for coming. And I'm going to invite our storyteller, Corinne, to come up um, to introduce you to our guest today, Tom. Um, thanks, Alex. My name is Corinne, and I'm a storyteller working with the Sawyer Center for Public Service this semester, and I'm very, very, very excited uh, to be able to introduce our guest today, Tom Ashbrook, uh, the inaugural speaker for the Sawyer Center's Storyteller Speaker Series. Um, perhaps most of you know him well for his award-winning WBUR show, On Point. But Mr. Ashbrook has had an incredibly diverse career, not only working across a variety of mediums in journalism, but also as an entrepreneur, a surveyor, and blaster in Alaska, um, and even a voice actor dubbing kung fu movies in China. Um, before entering the realm of radio 12 years ago, Mr. Ashbrook worked as a foreign correspondent and newspaper editor for South China Morning Post and the Boston Globe covering events in India, Vietnam, China, Somalia, Rwanda, Russia, and more. After serving in editor roles at the Boston Globe and winning the Livingston Award for national reporting, Mr. Ashbrook became a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, a fellowship that is awarded to experienced journalists who address the changing face of journalism. In 1996, Mr. Ashbrook left the Globe to take on a whole new challenge, um, becoming an internet entrepreneur, launching homeportfolio.com, and writing his book, The Leap, a memoir of love and madness in the internet gold rush on the whole new change. After the attacks on 9-11, however, amid journalistic chaos, Mr. Ashbrook was asked by NPR and WBUR in Boston to do a special coverage show, which soon became On Point. Part of his own description of On Point is as follows. We're looking to create a different kind of conversation about the country and the world we live in, about who we are and where we're going. Maybe it's the kind of national conversation you've always wanted. Fast, fun, serious, surprising, open to everyone, and above all, unflinchingly honest. Described by his colleagues as a force and one of the finest interviewers on radio and TV, period, he has clocked over 5,000 hours on, on, of on-point radio time, reaching 1.2 million listeners every week. With that, I'd like to welcome award-winning journalist, Mr. Tom Ashworth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell if I'm on. Am I on? Can you hear me all right? Good. Uh, thank you very much. It's very nice to be with you. I'm very pleased with such a nice turnout. Um, I'm afraid if I sit in that chair, I'll be in a re-education camp, <laughs> and you'll all school me for an hour. So maybe I'll stand. Um, it's great to be here, beautiful day, Brown looks awesome, aren't you privileged? <laughs> Let me repeat that, aren't you privileged? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's great to be here, sponsored uh, this uh, Swearer Center, fantastic, and Alex, thank you for the introduction, and thank you uh, very much, and uh, above all, I'm here because of the incomparable Lizzie Pollock, who's been inspiring to me for many years. Um, I'm delighted to talk with you about storytelling. Um, interviewing. Storytelling is kind of the air we breathe, isn't it, as humans? It's the context for everything. And let me tell you, as someone who works in talk radio, storytelling is a battleground. And whether you see it that way or not, it is. Everybody has their version of life and earth and society and aspiration. And the most powerful manifestations of all those are conveyed in story. So many days it seems to me that you're either telling a story that envelops other people or you're part of somebody else's story. I mean, it's a battle. It's a jungle out there in Storyland. And stories are incredibly important. Not stories without fact, at least not to a journalist, though fantasy stories have great power as well. But we are just enveloped at all moments by story. 
We are in the midst of huge fighting, battling narratives, certainly politically. I mean, we all know that. We've just come out of, I just came out of a 16-hour day yesterday uh, with what went on in Washington, which was in no small part and remains a deep battle over story, the story of what this country is, the story of what this country has been, a, a competition over that, a story battling stories about what this country ought to become. And there are global stories that are in competition as well. Competition is not necessarily a bad thing. Battle, you know, joyful warrior, not in the bloody sense we hope, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. We hope that our understanding of reality gets shaped in a positive way by story, but that's not guaranteed. Not all stories are good. Not all stories encourage justice. So when you step into life, in my view, you step, onto, you step into the realm of story. You all have stories that you tell about yourselves. Stories that you tell, hi. Stories that you tell, Dory, best intern ever, Brown. <laughs> Aren't you privileged? Aren't you privileged? Uh, best ever. Um, anyway, I'm going to come back to that. Let, let's start with uh, some of my own story because I think everything that you, well, no, uh, what, I don't know exactly what brings you here today. And if it's news, we'll talk about that. And I can't wait. And I'm really interested in your questions. And if it's uh, social entrepreneurships, entrepreneurship, uh, that is storytelling too. I don't know how it works here. If you put up a proposal, do they ask for a business plan or its equivalent? What is that but a story? I mean, there's almost nothing that we do that isn't surrounded at its heart, and maybe even is at its heart, story. Now, story isn't just flip the pages of a children's book or even the great novel. I mean, stories make reality. I hope not in the you know, George W. Bush way that hard reality doesn't matter, that you know, we, we say what's real and then that becomes reality. I hope not that way, but that, that works very often too. And uh, good realities have been made with story and bad realities have been made with story. Interviewing is another thing entirely, though it's all tied up with story and it itself, maybe I'm just story crazy, but even as the interviewer, you are conveying a story and, and I want to look at that. Um, yeah, I've done, you know, we do two shows a day, five days a week. That's uh, 10 a week, and we do it most all the time. So it's basically 500 shows, conversations a year. So that's over, that's getting on 6,000 now. They really add up. Um, on 9 11, I was driving from Boston with, the, with my entrepreneuring business partner to Manhattan on the morning of 9-11. Uh, we had left our first company and we were setting out to start another. Uh, we had interviews set up in Westport, Connecticut and in Lower Manhattan. As we were pulling into our first meeting in Westport, I got a call from my wife. She said, turn the radio on. Something's happening in New York. We heard confusing reports on the air. We went in for our meeting. We didn't know what was happening. There was no one at the front desk. Time's up? Okay, that's it. <laughs> um, ding! Uh, I expect my GPS to give me directions after that. Turn here! <laughs> um, and there was nobody at the front desk, and we said, hello, hello, and we walked in, and they were all in the boardroom overlooking these beautiful title flats. They were privileged, too, venture capitalists. And uh, they were all watching television, and something had already happened, and as we walked in, the second plane hit the towers, and. We didn't go to Manhattan that day. Three days later, as you said, I got a call from NPR. And they said, could you come in to WBUR? All of our staff have been working flat out, literally 24 hours a day, many of them, for three days. We need fresh horses. We know you're a journalist, and you're not doing journalism right now. Uh, so I went in. I sat down. And they said, could you go on the radio nationally, 500 stations, for three hours a night starting tomorrow? <laughs> I had never really done radio before. I had filled in one day uh, to, to substitute for somebody who was gone. But this was a moment when it was one of those duty called moments where you just say yes. And I said yes. I was freaking terrified. Mm. I had always done newspaper journalism. 
where you report and report and report, and then you think very carefully through everything you've heard, and then you shape it in text into a defined narrative that you ship off and somebody else edits it even after that, and maybe a third round of editing before it goes into the form that it will go out into the world and meet the public. And now, I was on radio three hours live every day, absolutely different experience. You sit down in the chair, you're in a studio, a red light goes on, and whatever is going to be is going to be created by you and your guests in that moment. Every hour of radio that I do has one minute of script. One minute of script and 59 minutes of whatever you make up in that hour. <laughs> Try doing that for the first time when you've never done it before. Uh, it was pretty scary. Uh, and it was kind of rugged, um, but you know, I was carried through, like many people are, in, in the start of many enterprises by urgency, in this case, emergency. And the audience was pretty forgiving because the issues were so overwhelming, mysterious, frightening. And I just tried to bring my journalistic training and an honest ear and voice into that setting and contribute what I could. I had left journalism in 1996 because I had only done newspapers. And when I began to see the internet coming on, I thought, newspapers are going to die. And I charted a graph of my age. I was 39 and the rise of the internet, and it looked like my medium would be dead when I was about 50. <laughs> and I decided I didn't want to be a high priest in a dying religion, and I jumped ship. I wasn't sure I would never, not come back to journalism, but I knew that it was going to have to change in some ways fundamentally, and nobody knew what those were, and I wanted to go out and get a nose full of it uh, and come back. Coming back to radio in the midst of the emergency of 9-11 was an incredible experience. And above all, I had the thrill of a new medium, radio, which after those first terrifying days and weeks of not knowing what the hell I was doing, just plunging in, I found absolutely a riveting medium, the live quality of it. You know, uh, the f deeper I get into life, the more I want to be, as they say, in the moment. And there's nothing more in the moment than live broadcasting. Because whatever it's going to be, you're making right there. And I quickly found radio absolutely addictive. Now I do it two hours a day, and many, many days, those are the best two hours of my day. Kind of euphoric experience. Euphoric because the engagement is so complete. The focus is so intense. Uh, the spotlight is so bright and you're in it. The need, the requirement to deliver value in those, in those minutes of that hour, I feel viscerally as absolute. Uh, and so, you know, they say we humans use 10% of our brains. And under all that kind of pressure and joy of performance or whatever it is, in those hours I feel that I use 10.1% of my brain, and that is a very special experience. And uh, I wish it for anybody, if you're interested in communicating, don't compete with me. <laughs> but otherwise, I hope you do it and have a great time with it. Don't help them, Dory. <laughs> don't give away the secrets. It's funny because we are in the storytelling age of ages now where, you know, all of you can podcast tonight and be my competitors immediately. So, <laughs> I want to tell you that it's hellish. <laughs> it's terrible, and you don't want to do it. No, it's just a fact. I want to, I want to talk a little about that as well. Um, storytelling, whether, it's, whether it comes out in news or whether it comes out in fiction, uh, especially in news, it has everything to do with, with what's going on in the world, but it also has to do with how we see what's going on in the world, and if you're the journalist, whether you like it or not, there's no absolutely sterile Petri dish for growing these stories that we tell in the news. You will bring yourself to it. You will be the vessel in which it gets delivered. Who you are will have a lot to do with how you convey the news. And that is particularly true in the role that's come to me, the role of interviewer, which is kind of interlocutor, intermediary, shaper, framer of story, not just originator of story. So. Um, I want to just share a little story about my background because 
it turns out, and I see this with incredible clarity now, that every single day in every conversation I have, and as you begin storytelling, you might as well get used to this as well, because whether you see it or not or acknowledge it or not, I believe it's going to be going on. Your own fingerprints are all over every story that you tell or just convey or just um, facilitate. I grew up on, a, on an old family farm in the Midwest. Um, my kinfolk settled it in 1818. It's right in the middle of the state of Illinois, the biggest county in Illinois, and they were the first settlers in that county in 1818. The story is that it was the first uh, settlement between um, St. Louis and Chicago at that time. Who knows? But they were certainly the first ones there. Um, so I grew up in an environment, I often think now, it was very 19th century, even when I was a boy, it was old-fashioned farming. Um, it was communal farming in many ways. This was before the age of giant industrial machinery and the farmers who lived around that neighborhood knew each other very well and we all worked with each other, whether we were baling hay or walking the beans or planting or harvesting or whatever it was, castrating the hogs. It was a big event, let me tell you. <laughs> there were a lot of testes on the ground, but there were a lot of hogs. And we boys were flinging them. Um, but it was all, we all worked together. It was a very um, labor intensive world where being a child was no exemption. And we worked, and we worked a lot from a very early age. It was a very multi generational environment where boys of 10 and 11 and 12 were working with farmers in the, in the height of their uh, lives, you know, 30, 40, 50, and with grandfathers. My grandfather, who was still very active as a farmer, and I worked right by him all the time. It was a very um, religion-infused culture, lucky for me, in a beautiful way. It was a kind of God is love uh, environment in the, in the churches that were dominant at that time. It was before the whole rise of angry evangelical churches, and that was a very beautiful thing. Uh, we were told, we sang in church, you know, that God is in everything, in rustling grass, I hear him pass, uh, he's with me everywhere. And, you know, if you're a boy who's growing up in that and uh, the world around you looks abundant and uh, I didn't live through the Dust Bowl, I lived through times of fairly abundant crops and you've got lots of generations and your family's been there forever, you can sort of feel the ghosts of them around you in a good way. The stories of them are all around you, what brought them here, what kept them here, why they th survived on the farm when others didn't. Um, it was really a great uh, childhood. It was very rich with stories. I grew up uh, in an environment where men and women would sit and talk, just talk a lot. It wasn't Amish, but it was close to it. I had Mennonite aunts who wore long black Mother Hubbards and black bonnets that had veils they could flip over their face, almost Porta. Uh, but to us, that was just natural, and they would always come around. That particular gaggle of ants would come at canning time in the late summer, and when we'd be canning tomatoes and sweet corn, and they'd sit and talk and talk, and the boys were welcome to be there alongside them, and I, I heard all that talk of the women and the men. The talk was intense and just ceaseless. Anytime you weren't working, there was talk, and there were patterns of conversation, and there were rhythms to the interactions, so that it was a kind of call and response and handoff and trade-off. We'd sit down in the grain elevator when we delivered wagons full of corn or soybeans or oats or wheat, and while we waited for that to be dumped in and weighed and measured and readied for the train, they'd just talk and talk next to the nickel soda pop cooler, and you'd hear all these stories. And so as a boy, I was, I was washed over with stories all the time. My mother, in the midst of that, was a great internationalist. Uh, you know, one of the things that our government did after World War II, maybe it was a Cold War response, maybe trying like the Marshall Plan to make a better world, to make peace, they started something called International Farm Youth Exchange. Probably nobody in this room has ever touched by it, but in the rural parts of this country, it was a big deal for kids who were picked up and sent abroad to live for six months or a year abroad. My mother did that. Uh, became a great internationalist as a result, and our little house on the prairie was always full of these visitors from abroad, from Nicaragua and Egypt and Thailand, 
and there was a great international thread to it. It got me really interested in the world, and when I was 16, my parents said, you know, you're so, you're so full of beans. You want to get out there and see what's going on. Why don't, and, you know, why don't you go out? You've got to go to college soon. Why don't you go out and check it out? And I was very excited to do that. They, the crop prices had not been good. Mm. They didn't have much money. They didn't have any money that year. But my mom had a friend at the Peoria Stockyards, which were about an hour and a half from our little farm. And they drove me over, and they put me up in the cab of a semi-trailer truck full of hogs, pigs, that were headed for the slaughterhouse in Philadelphia. And I spent the next two and a half days on that truck going across the country, learning a lot of new language from the truck driver. <laughs> uh, learning thing. I mean, I had some basics, but he had much more elaboration. <laughs> um, learning about uh, certain kinds of drugs that you didn't give to uh, the veterinarian, didn't give to our cattle. Um, and um, got down in the stockyard in Philadelphia, got on a bus and came to uh, New Haven and Cambridge and um, ended up at Yale. Um, I always thought that my affirmative action program in those days was that I smelled very powerfully agricultural. <laughs> I really did. And so there was a certain authenticity uh, that you can't write into an essay when you've been riding with a truck full of pigs for two and a half days. <laughs> and so have all of your clothes. Um, I often wonder how I ended up in this business and why I enjoy it so much and whether uh, I, it turns out that I enjoy it more than I enjoyed writing. And I enjoyed writing a lot. I always loved writing. I wanted to write the great American novel. But I had to pay, you know, the, the bills. And so I went to work for the South China Morning Post. And uh, way back when China was still closed, that was awesome. All spent year, 10 years in Asia, all over Asia, telling uh, stories out of Asia. Just fantastic, lucky stories. I was there when uh, the night that Ferdinand Marcos fled the Malacanang Palace in the Philippines. Most of you are too young to remember, but it was a big deal. And uh, Filipinos had surrounded the palace in the middle of the night, and a few of us noticed that the guards had actually left, and there were three journalists. So we just went and pushed the gate, and it was open. And before the crowds came in, we just wandered through the through the palace, we saw the big machine guns under the grand pianos where they had readied to make their last stand and apparently decided not to when the US flew them out. Wandered into a room that was full of shoes. Uh, and it was about as big as this room, but underground. And I, had, I just could not understand where I was until I walked up the spiral staircase out of this room and I was in Imelda Marcos' bedroom, all alone, just me. And there was an enormous circular bed, like from here to the rail with one of those gauzy uh, curtain things that come down from the ceiling with the crown all around it. There were huge flagons of perfume, yay tall, like incredible huge flagons. And at the edge, the end, whatever you call it, the bed, I had always wondered on what basis is Ferdinand Marcos ruling this country? I cannot figure out how he makes his decisions. It's mysterious to me. And here at the edge of the bed was an incredible um, mahogany Ouija board. <laughs> with an ivory uh, thingy that traveled over it. And for a minute, it, was an, it had been an exhausting day. You know, outside, it was just chaos and gunfire. And I just sat down on their bed, toying with that little ivory thing on the Ouija board, <laughs> thinking about the machine guns and the fires out behind the palace where Marcos was trying to burn all of his letters. But they weren't all burning. We stuffed them. Anyway, it was a great, great time. Um, in China, in Korea, and in, uh, in India, after Indira Gandhi was killed. But I digress, or maybe I don't. Uh, interestingly, in terms of story, after two years at Yale, I was ready to quit. It was too secular for me. I didn't understand that level of s that degree of secularness. I didn't know how to relate to it. I didn't feel surrounded by people who felt that God was in everything. And for me, at that age, 17, 18 years old, um, I just didn't, that was a, a culture shock that was very deep for me. Um, and you know, I know you all went to Andover, but I didn't. <laughs> and it was, it, was a, it was a real cold water bath, like catching up with all my peers there. And I was ready to drop out. Um, a sign of where I was, maybe I was at the Yale Divinity School. That was my favorite class, was in Vedantic mysticism. 
And I loved it because these are the pre-Hindu, ancient South Asian uh, um, uh, religious texts. And in the Vedas, the Rig Veda, uh, there's a God for everything. You know, there's a God of fire, there's a God of wind, there's a God of the dawn, God is, and I thought, oh my God, I'm home in the, in the Vedas. And one of my classmates there who was in the Divinity School said, you're dropping? I said, don't do that, go to India. Uh, you can study there for a year and then come back and finish up here. And I did, and it was a total mind-blowing, uh, uh, eye-opening experience, and on we went. Why do I like radio so much? And how will you know what, if you found the right place you are in stories? There's something that happened a, a lot when I was a boy that I never thought about again until I got into radio, and then it all came back to me. Our farm, it was an old farm, so there were lots of different farmsteads within it, aunts and uncles and grandpa and ours. And, uh, but our little house was on a bluff in the prairie over the Kickapoo Creek. And down by the creek, uh, there was a big pasture that went all the way back to what we called down below, uh, the cropland behind. Uh, it was too low for farming, so it was our pasture land. It had a lot of gnarly groves of trees and, and uh, gnarly tall creek banks and a lot of pasture and a lot of black Angus cattle that we kept there. And I used to love as a boy, I discovered, you know how the, the whole cattle thing, how they low and how they moo and how could they moo, all that stuff. And I just loved that. I would listen to them and I thought, they're they really are talking with one another. They're telling, I don't know, maybe they're telling stories. So when we'd be down by the creek, sometimes just myself, because in the country you're not always with a ton of people, you know, and you'd be kicking clods and I would start talking to them, mooing to them. And way back in the pasture there was this one big clearing. And I laugh when I think about this now, but I discovered that if I stood in the middle of this big clearing, and just began mooing and picking up on their moos and lowing and all the different little variations that I could hear and how they mooed and lowed, these big black Angus, eight, nine hundred pound cows, would gather around me in a perfect circle. <laughs> you know the way muskox do it the other way to defend their young? Well, this would be the opposite. They would gather around in a perfect circle and they would respond. They'd listen and they'd look, and the more I mixed it up and varied it and tried to imitate them, the more would gather. And there would easily be 30 or 40 big black Angus cattle standing around me on, a, on an autumn day like this. You know, you'd see the steam coming out as they were breathing, and they'd just be looking. And, and I would moo and they would moo, and I would moo and they would moo. <laughs> and I went home and told my mother I wanted to be a preacher or a farm veterinarian. I wasn't sure which. <laughs> But now when I sit there at that microphone <laughs> and I say something and people say something back <laughs> and I listen for the tone in what they say or the texture of it or the feeling of it and I try and, you know, give them some of that back to encourage them to respond in more depth and I'm not sure these things are completely different. <laughs> now. I have to put a very important disclaimer here because this is NPR for God's sake. <laughs> and it's very high minded. So these are not cattle and cows and it's not livestock and it's not a pasture. But there may be something about the instinct of who's going to be a storyteller, who's going to be a communicator, who's going to be a talk radio host. If you've ever done that thing in the pasture, think of yourself as a candidate. <laughs> um, uh, interviewing. Um, I do it every day. Uh, we. we uh, try to be fearless in our subject choice and we try to be diverse in our subject choice. Whatever's going on, we try to go right to the heart of it. We try and get the very best guests we can. We're lucky in that, even in the day when you can all podcast and compete with me because of that NPR brand, that NPR label. People want to be associated with it. Dory knows everything, but she also knows that <laughs> Um, you know, when we call and invite people to be on the NPR show with that kind of audience across the country and actually these days around the world, we looked one quarter recently at visitors to our website, which I take as a kind of proxy. We had visitors from 162 countries in one quarter. That's a lot of people paying attention. Uh, you know, there's a listenership here that's bigger than our country. Uh, but they come on. Um, I have a great staff of about 10 people, producers, engineer, director, interns. Um, the reason the show is like it is at heart is because NPR Public Radio is willing to make that kind of investment in people, in minds, who when we've chosen a subject and we've framed it up and said, here's what we want to do, every day right after the show we have our daily news meeting. 
First we say, how'd the show go? First hour great, second hour sucked. First hour sucked, second hour great, whatever. You know, we, we talk about how things worked and what worked and what didn't. Who was a good guest that we want to have back? Who we never want to talk to again? Because they don't deliver on air. Not because of what they said, but because they just can't communicate. Um, uh, and then we look ahead. What do we want to do tomorrow? What do, we, what do we want to do next week? And we think, okay, here's the subject. Subject's not enough because you have to be compelling when you're telling stories. Not just, I want to talk about, but we want to talk about this issue through this prism or through this frame. And then, who do we want? Do we want someone alone? Is there somebody with such a rich, deep, vivid understanding of that subject that we can put them on for an hour and we'll never run out of juice? Or is this something we need to debate? Uh, and if we're going to have a debate, what are the chairs in that debate? What, how do we want this, this debate to be most richly represented in the hour? Of course, there's a lot of that, but it's by no means always that. Uh, and then, so those are the chairs. If it's a debate, what are the facets that we want to have represented? Who represents this? Who's that? Are we going to have a referee kind of guest? Are we going to have a, di a dissenter from a, an unexpected angle? And then we say, all right, they're the chairs. Who do we want to fill them? After 5,000, 6,000 shows watching the news all the time, you have a pretty good idea of many realms of who great guests are. But sometimes we're in brand new territory. And hallelujah, there's the internet. We can go, we can research it. We can talk with our peers and colleagues at NPR and beyond. We can track down the best guests. And in the space of a couple of hours, my producers, because I've got them, can give me a great stack of research that I can then take home and inhale um, and come in the next day ready to talk about in depth. Um, this particular kind of storytelling and communicating takes a lot of discipline and commitment because it's every single day. Uh, and depending on the kind of storytelling you do, you might write one story in your life or one novel in a decade or, you know, much more humane kind of rhythm. Ours is nonstop. But that's cool in a different way. And that gets to this idea of, of the bigger story. You'll, you, you'll read and tell individual stories in your life, but in many ways, all of us are a walking story. And if you're moderating or facilitating, even as you go over incredibly diverse subjects, you yourself and your perspective on the world, wherever it was born, you know, along the Kickapoo Creek or you know, here, uh, you're very, in many ways, you are the through line. What's important to you? What do you latch on to? What are you searching for? What's the kind of er question that lives beneath a lot of your other questions? What are you trying to bring out? What are you trying to celebrate? What tone are you setting? Is it a tone of disdain or respect? Um, what are you looking to uphold? All these things in yourself, your expectations about people, what you see in them naturally, because it's what you're looking for, because it's what you've, you've grown to expect through your own experience. All these things come into play. You know, in interviewing, we're trying always to bring out uh, the most important issues, the facts that are most edifying and illuminating. But there always comes a point in a good interview where there's a turn, and sometimes multiple turns, where you want to get into the person who's speaking and try and figure out what's behind that voice. What does the world look like from behind their eyes? What's their angle of observation? I mean, even beyond their motivation, who are they? What's important to them? What's generating their worldview? Uh, and that's often one of the most illuminating moments in an interview. You set out when you're interviewing to establish confidence and trust. You establish a rhythm where they feel comfortable speaking. You establish a kind of respect where they feel that what they say is going to be heard and listened to carefully and that you're responding from an informed, because you've got producers doing research and you've read it, um, and uh, an engaged way. You know, when I first came in, um, I sat down to do the first shows and I, the producers just automatically handed me 15 questions to take into the show. Uh, and a, that, I learned, was the sort of standard for interview shows. And so they did it. And after about three days, I said, you know what, I, I really don't want those because to do a good, vibrant, live interview, you want to be, first of all, so well backgrounded that you're just brimming with questions and you don't want an arbitrary, artificial path of questions that may lead off this way when the real energy and import of the interview you can feel naturally, organically wants to go that way. And so I scrapped all those. We don't go in with any um, pre-written questions. I just come in brimming 
with questions and, and issues. Um, digital storytelling, I don't know where this is going to go. Everybody can tell stories now. I, I got into journalism when the big newspaper or the big broadcaster, and I did TV a little bit in Hong Kong as well, they had the megaphones. They had the big organs of mass communication and they had, compared to now, they had no competition. There'd be little journals and little this and little that. If you were nutty enough, you could stand on a street corner. And that's what people did. <laughs> you know, Hyde Park, stand on a box. Now, everybody's got their own box and everybody can talk. So, I grew up in the time when these sort of institutional organs of communication had a lot of power to shape the story or the stories around us. You are all um, you know, children of the era where that is not the case. And I don't know how that's going to turn out. I'm really, really intrigued by it. Part of me feels like, you know, I'm lucky to be just old enough that I can finish my career in the remains of big institutional communication, which will support big audiences, um, which will, you know, pay my grocery bills, and which will support a staff of producers to help me do really deep, credible, informed uh, journalism. At th 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 that is the, the vehicle for the storytelling. What happens in your generation, I don't know, because everybody can tell a story. Few will have the resources to go out and really do the digging and information collection. On the other hand, information collection is easier than, than ever. So you, a single person, can do the information collection today in a couple of hours that would have taken me maybe you know, three, four, five days as a solo journalist when it was microfilm and microfiche and you can't email and you can't ask. It was very labor intensive. So maybe it balances out. I don't know where we go with a, um, I don't know what to call it, a symphony or a cacophony of storytellers instead of big storytellers. I mean, surely we see that the mainline stories are being overthrown and undermined and eroded and disempowered by thousands, millions of sort of fine hair stories that are coming up. Now some story lines will still rise and be dominant. Um, every time you go out, if this is what you intend to do, whether as journalists or social entrepreneurs, and you bring home a story that you now have the means for sharing uh, so easily online, uh, you'll be adding to that symphony. You'll be tilting it. Collectively, there are still going to be big stories there will probably be big uber storytellers who gather them, orchestrate them, turn, you know, feel them and turn them around. Uh, I assume there will still be dominant storylines about who we are and where we want to go, but part of what's happening right now, just in the last two weeks in Washington, is the breakdown of that. Um, clearly into two big camps, um, and more than two now, three really, put the Tea Party in there, but really more than that. Uh, the storyline of our national life is getting away from everybody. And that's part of what I think is creating a sort of a panic in certain parts of society that can, that can uh, provoke um, um, of reaction, a, a kind of reactionary response. So it's very interesting where storytelling is going to be going. It's not going to be like it was. You all determine that. We have time for talking to each other. And should we do that? <laughs> so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or I'm sure I missed everything. But <laughs> it's really great to be here. Do you want to do, you want to do q and I'm an interviewer. I know how to do it. Uh, does anybody want to? What, what do you want to talk about? NPR. Question? NPR? What about it? What is it like being there? Um, well, first of all, you should know that there's not really a there there. Uh, I mean, there is. It's got the big headquarters in Washington. But for us, uh, we're lucky to be based at WBUR in Boston, one of the biggest public radio stations in the country with a lot of deep resources. We produce the show really 99.9% .9 independently of NPR Central. We get input from them rarely. Um, and our our real NPR judge are the member stations around the country. They can pick you up and air you, or they can decide not to. Uh, we've had great pickup. We're on 250 or 300 stations now around the country, which is great. Um, uh, NPR, ha but, it, but at the same time, I say, you know, in operational terms, the interaction is light, which I love. I'm kind of an uh, authority-resistant individual. Um, but. NPR has created in its lifetime a sort of uh, skein of values and expectations that were very much 
part of it that we feel and that we want to live up to and even improve. Um, we, I think at our show, we feel like part of the mission is to keep NPR vital, keep it ur as urgent as the issues of the day. Any big dominant news organization uh, can get a little snoozy, and we try and keep it brisk and happening um, because we think the issues are big enough that they require that. I mean, it's great to have this network that's out there that wants the kind of thing we do, that's supported by people all over the country who will actually write checks for something they don't have to uh, because they want it. That's incredible power. And uh, I can't think of a better place to be. I mean, I have watched journalism, huge, important chunks of it just fall away and go away and they're not going to come back in anything like this, the, the shape they were. For a while, I was foreign editor at the Boston Globe, foreign editor. When I was for, at the Boston Globe, we had five or six bureaus abroad, Moscow, Jerusalem, Tokyo, London, Mexico City. Now they don't even have a foreign desk. They don't even have an editor devoted to foreign news. And their newsroom has been decimated he, all over the place. It's not like it was. I have this feeling I'm standing on this little beautiful island at BUR and NPR where the resources are still there, where the values of their listenership still are so keenly felt that they will step forward and spe you know, put their money where their mouth is to support it. It's, but it's a little thing. It's like the, you know, it's like the Arctic ice cap. Uh, and it's still shrinking. So I don't know how long it'll last, but it's, it's a great place to be. The values are right, and uh, the uh, whip hand is light. Uh, you've made clear that you think storytelling will go on in some form or fashion, but uh, what is the future of radio as a medium? I don't know. I mean, uh, when I came into newspapers, they were so incredibly powerful. They had, their profit margins were so gigantic. You know, when I was doing reporting in Asia, I mean, I was always in five-star hotels, flying business class. The advice they gave me when I went out was, uh, to be bureau chief was, don't cheapen the bureau. Are you kidding me? Today, <laughs> You can't get 20 bucks to drive across town. Now, I mean, we went out, we did the hard reporting, you know, all that was great to have behind us. But then with all that, newspapers went away. I was at the Boston Globe when the New York Times paid $1 billion for the Boston Globe. I was there that night, I was a, one of the top editors we all celebrated. Um, last month, they sold it for 50 million. You know, that's just the value of the land it sits on. So if that can happen in newspapers, it can happen anywhere else. Radio is not invulnerable. You can do all kinds of internet broadcasting, and many people do. I mean, I'm feeling this, you know. I'm telling my staff, build our online listenership as quickly and big as possible because the land grab is on. You know, he who waits is lost. Twitter came out. Scott Simon went on. He's got, you know, he's one of the first guys on Twitter and NPR. He's got, I don't know, two million followers. And that's before he tweeted his mother's death. <laughs> We're in a new age. Um, you know, come later and it's harder. So there's a kind of land grab going on right now. Uh, there will be radio for a while, but you know, Detroit is, and, and the other automakers are going to start having internet radio standard in automobiles very soon. That's a big shift. So I don't know how long radio will be around in the form that it's in now. It's changed a lot already. Look at music. It's become so, you know, computerized and automated. A lot of the organic sort of local texture has been taken out of it. NPR is, um, is a refuge at the moment, and I think it'll last longer than most, long enough for me. <laughs> Hi, uh, so I'm a first year graduate student in anthropology, and I was wondering if you have any suggestions for those of us who you know, use storytelling in our academic work and how um, sort of the digital age may help to bring that out of the academic realm into, into the broader public sphere. Well, I mean, that's, that's interesting. I, you know, um, I'm kind of an, an, an emotive person, so the academic form was always challenging for me. I wanted to moo to cows, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> that's not academic. That's earthy, right? I love that. Um, I wanted to write poetry, you know? Uh, elite, you're studying anthropology. That's got human qualities attached to it, anthro. So those stories matter <laughs> in, in your field. I mean, I assume Um, I don't know what's going to happen. It's really interesting. You know, there's all this talk now about how peer-reviewed journals are running into trouble because there's these new online journals with very little peer review, even in medicine and science, that are publishing without a lot of peer review. Publishing's always been the hurdle, right? 
you know, publish or perish if you're an academic. And I assume it's going to become easier to get published. I don't know what pr those pressures will do to the idea of academic publishing. I don't know if it will bring a more populist pressure to bear on academia. Look at you. You want a bigger audience, right? You don't just want the other professors. And of course you do, and why shouldn't you? Because it's available now. But if you start looking for that bigger audience, will you become Glenn Beck? Well, you could. <laughs> I've heard him describe himself, I think, as an anthropologist. You too could be Glenn Beck. <laughs> I mean, I think you'll have more opportunities. There'll be new kinds of pressure. They won't just be, you won't just be academically driven. The little teufel devil of popularity may, may do great things for academics, or it may have a, cor a corrupting influence. I don't know. But I'm guessing that one way or another, there probably will be more pressure on you to be a more effective public storyteller. People worry about academics, the humanities now, right? How do, how do you get people to see the value of it when they just want to be investment bankers and Silicon Valley studs and studettes? Um, so I don't know. I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> how and where do you get your news? Um, well, like you, I bathe in it, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's all around us. I mean, everywhere you turn. I mean, I, you know, of course, I read the Times and the Wall Street Journal and all the magazines and, um, and the big general news feeds and, uh, and Rolling Stone and Mother Jones and, and National Review and the Weekly Standard. You know, you've got to kind of just, now you can't read all of that. You can't read everything these days, but I've got my, my sort of go-to that I touch, 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 what's there, what's there, what do, what do I need to know? Interestingly, this is storytelling, too, of a different kind of it. You know, Twitter, it turns out, is an important news source for me because I've got my hundred, you know, people and sources that I follow. And in any real-time way, I can pull that phone out and kind of see, because I'm following people who care and pay attention to the kind of news and range of news that I care about, I can see very quickly, like, oh, 11 seconds ago, you know, here's where that story turned. That's way more important than I would have guessed three years ago, like incredibly important um, as a sort of flow of con stream of consciousness uh, where you can choose what little uh, octet or you know hundred people you want to follow to shape it and if it's news aware people that's very powerful so some combination just the flow and then deliberate you know hitting the sort of stations of the cross of the things that I read yeah so kind of the counter question to that is we live in this super saturated news world do you ever find yourself just wanting refuge from it and is there a place that you go to uh, to escape the news? Absolutely. I walk my dog. <laughs> I read Rumi uh, and, and, um, and all of his bros, and not only bros. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that stuff is very important to me. Uh, y you know, if you live saturated in it like I do, you, if, if you care about other sides of life, you have to actively cultivate them. Uh, I have a very active, um, imagination. I have a very active, I, th I, I don't know, I think spiritual life. I care about those rhythms and those vibes and that perspective. I have a really rock and love life. Um, well, <laughs> you asked. Um, uh, since we were 16, it's cool. Um, uh, yeah, and I walk the dog. I don't know. I mean, and I get back to the farm, the Kickapoo Creek, whatever, whenever I can. How are we doing? Yeah. Um, I have a question about kind of the listenership of On Point. So one of my favorite things about driving home every six hour drive between here and Ithaca is that um, I don't Not know. Not daily. Well, no. <laughs> but I, but several, to, like almost once a month. And my, okay. Because I love it. And my favorite thing is that uh, I don't know what's on the radio. So I kind of get a feeling of where I am based on what's coming up on the radio. And I don't know that it's a Christian preacher for a couple minutes at yeah. the NPR. And yeah. So I think on the flip side of that, the reason I love On Point is that because it's radio and you're not easily able to say, no, it's Fox, no, it's, you know, uh, some other kind of, you know, yeah. MSNBC. Yeah. Um, you're able to bring in people who have much more diverse views than I think most people who listen to NPR would be exposed to otherwise. Mm -hmm. Curious with um, kind of introduction of internet radio mm -hmm. or kind of other sources where it's all, we have more control, increasingly control over what we take in. Mm -hmm. um, if you think that diversity is going to be lost. Uh, well, I hope not. I, it could, it, I mean, lots of it has been lost in a way already. Lots of people are siloing into the messages and information that they want. I mean, okay, here's the big story of On Point. 
it's not just single interview driven, it's not just information driven. We have a very deliberate conscious mission. And our slash my, because I don't know if it's shared actu actually or not, but it's my mission, is that uh, I'm really freaked out by the degree of polarization in this country and I find it artificially enhanced and exaggerated by special interests that are promoting it and by people's fears that don't need to be as acute as they are and by an artificial sense of division and I, I'm, I am actively trying to build the biggest tent that we can from an NPR base in the national populace. Uh, when we get truck drivers from North Dakota and good old boys from South Carolina calling in and forthrightly and without fear or shame stating what they think, whatever it is, I never, I don't diss them. I question them, but I don't diss them. I think of us as always tonally inviting the whole country. Tonally, you know, it, it actually, where you come from matters. In that tone, it matters that I'm a farm kid who went to Yale. So we grab those smarty pants guys, you know, at Harvard, and we grab truck drivers in Nebraska. And we are really proud of that. We try to guest the show so that the whole range of political views gets represented. And that is not easy because if you go, if you lean too far, you know, the body can re the, uh, reject the organ. I mean, it's an NPR show, <laughs> right? Uh, right? But we're putting all kinds of funky organs in there and treating them with respect and, and saying, look, you there on the left, you actually need and want to hear this voice from the right, not in a haranguing way, but really in a, in a, okay, what do you really mean by that? You know, sort of pulling out what they mean. And you on the right, this is not foreign territory to you. It doesn't just smell like, you know, white wine and brie. This is, we got cowboy boots here too, and you can come in here and you may hear some presumptions that you don't share, but you'll hear a fundamental respect for you as a citizen. In the show, as we do it, the way we guest it, the way we present it, the way we talk to our guests, and especially the way we talk to our callers, we are trying to model something every single hour. We're trying to model, um, it sounds so dorky, but we're trying to model American citizenship, which is a really grand and beautiful and fantastic thing. I mean, we're the first constitutional democracy. We set out all these great ideals. We corrupted them from the very first instant, but we got them down on paper. <laughs> and they're real. And they're too often ignored. And we are trying to embody and personify and model that respectful community of, um, well, this may be my corner of it, where I come from, but of, of, of respect and love, love for one another because to have a really effective community, which is what, God help us, we better be, you've got to have that. You've got to have respect, and ultimately, you've even got to have love in there. And we, it may sound crazy to talk about that in the context of news, but there's a, there's a thrum, there's a tone under everything, under every story, under every news show, and that's the kind of thrum we try to have under On Point. As, as the, are there other places that you see that that happens, other than your show? Of course, or I mean, like, no, you know, as radio is going, we are the Messiah. Well, look, it's, it's rare, and it's rare for a reason. It's, if you're commercial, you're going to zoom much more quickly to commercial success if you stake out a wild-ass polarized position and just beat the drum like crazy and scare the holy hell out of people that they better gather around you in your little fortress in a hurry and you will save their asses. That's how to make money. That's why, you know, Bill O'Reilly makes 25 million per contract and whatever it is, you know. That's why Rush Limbaugh lives in a, you know, million square foot house in Florida um, because he does that. You know, we are sheltered from that by um, some of the realities of public radio that it has a listenership that is willing to consider a non-polarized view, to value it. Not, and that doesn't mean empty, it doesn't mean bland, it doesn't mean neutral, it doesn't mean, in fact, it means it better be hyper-informed because your juice isn't coming from political emotion. The best of it is coming from a more enlightenment era sort of understanding or approach to the world. And they'll support it, and they'll pay for it. And we don't, necess we don't have to live in mansions. Doing this kind of work is a huge reward in itself. So, yeah, there are, there are other people and places that do it and have elements of it, but a whole lot of what's going on is driven by a profit motive that gets pulled in more polarized directions. 
what are qualities of a good storyteller? Is it enough to kind of stand up and say, this is my worldview, or are there filters to use? Are there ways to provoke conversation? You know, I don't really know. Um, in, in, when I came back from India and went back to Yale, I was lucky to be in, a, in a, cl a fiction class. Maybe you've all done your creative writing moment, you know, in college. And uh, I was lucky to have um, a really interesting figure, kind of controversial figure, but an ed editor at that time who was a very big deal named Gordon Lish. He's still around. You're taping. Hi, Gordon. Thank you. Um, he was Raymond Carver's editor. And Raymond Carver, as you know, uh, you know um, had this very pared down style that became really hot in the late 70s, early 80s. Gordon Lish later got in hot water because it turns out <coughs> he edited very hard. Um, and to the point that it was almost, people said, abusive. But he was this real inspiring um, uh, evangelist for great storytelling and creative writing story fiction. And he said something that there that powered all of our work in that class and that powers my work as a journalist. And he said, tell the most honest, truthful thing about whatever you're looking at, including yourself, even if it seems unbelievably painful or disgusting or shameful, no matter what it is. Tell, tell the, tell the honest thing, and no matter how weird or sh shameful even it seems or sounds, everybody will understand it if it's honest, if it's true. And I have found that to be the case. You know that weird thing you do that you don't want anybody to know? If you stated it right now, everybody would go, oh my God, and then they think, oh geez. <laughs> I do that too. Or I'd like to. <laughs> um, so I mean, I th maybe that's the most important thing. You know, be, be just as honest and truthful as you can, even when it feels weird, or even when it hurts a little bit, or feels like you're exposing things that should be hidden, because those are probably absolutely universal things, and it will get you closer. It'll it'll make very compelling storytelling because people will know what you're talking about. Whereas if you're, you know, just shooting bull, they'll know that too, and you, you won't really grab them. Tell the truth. Um, so it's interesting that you were sort of mentioning how much of ourselves we bring to stories that we tell, you know, and it's also interesting that you were mentioning how news is becoming almost crowdsourced. I don't want to use that yeah. word, but in yeah. some sense, yeah, you know, it's sort of, it's unfiltered at this point. You get it from Reddit, for example. I mean, people can post whatever they want, right, anonymously, and you can choose What's to What's news? I'm not sure, it. but, but yeah, yes, in right. a way, yeah. So how much of information then is becoming free will, if you will? You know, we used to be fed our information by these big sort of single storytellers, right? And now we can pick and choose. And everybody's going to bring their own truth to what they're talking about, right? So is that going to cause this huge paradigm shift in what we perceive is information these days? You know, is that, do you see that coming? And is that a bad thing? Well, I mean, there's clearly a lot more latitude for that. And a whole lot of that is a good thing. Because think how, think what a giant, cold, dead vice our heads were in, in this country for a long time in many ways. I mean, we got locked in. My friend Steve Kinzer has this new book out on the Dulles brothers. John Foster Dulles you know, and his brother, they ran the CIA and the State Department. And they thought the world had to be 100% open to big American corporations, you know, the banana companies and all the rest, or else go in and freaking kill those people. And they did it in Guatemala. They did it in Iran. Uh, and we live with the blowback. And they, I, I just listened to him talking to Terry Gross through this, so I listened too, right? Um, damn, I wanted to get him first, but anyway. Um, uh, and he was saying, the Dulles brothers deliberately, when I and a few others in this audience were kids, we literally had to go out in the hallway at school, put books over our head, and cower against nuclear bombs. How weird is that? They promoted that practice because it would viscerally implant the story of danger. And they considered danger to be essential to national unity, a story of danger. It's not that there wasn't any, but ramp it up, baby. So that was one great big story that just had our heads in a kind of a vice. And in many ways, the 60s was about you know, exploding an equal and opposite reaction to that. Now, you can't put a vice on quite like that. There's stuff oozing out all over the place. Even if you're China, even if you're willing to do everything. What did Vietnam have recently? This thing that said, only talk about personal things online. Don't even talk about anything political online. But you can't easily enforce that. So yeah, there's a lot more freedom in the way people look at the world, what they hear, what they want to hear, what they believe, what they absorb. And a lot of that is good. But it could sort of 
stampede or just ramble off in the direction of collective fantasy, fantasies. Now, ultimately, that won't work because, you know, nature plays the last card. And so, you know, climate change, we're definitely doing this here. We're like, we have all kinds of distraction from this big story. And so it gets worse and it'll, it'll whack us one day. I'm not sure, though, that nature's time frame is an effective discipline for human behavior, <laughs> right? We have two and four year election cycles. Nature's working on this great big thing, so a century from now she's going to kapow. In the meantime, we will have done a whole lot of things that may be really crazy. So what else will? I mean, we need honest brokers, storytellers who are empowered or elevated. Ideally, those, some of them would be politicians. So which one's the most honest? I mean, and who's willing to stay at it, that honesty, you know? Of course, they, politicians, they can't be honest all the time because we're all, we're all a, you know, a, what are they, what's it, a hot mess. That's the thing. <laughs> we're all a hot mess and they have to deal with us, right? So sometimes they have to say everything's fine when it's freaking falling apart, but they say everything's fine to, so that we'll like line up and do the necessary. <laughs> but, but we need some of them to be honest. You know, we need fiction writers to be honest. We need uh, a culture of honesty and fact-based inquiry to uh, be uh, propagated on the web at large. And I don't, I don't know how you measure that. And it'll rise and fall, right? I mean, look, medieval period, whole lots of voodoo crap craziness going on. Everybody thought that's just what life is. <laughs> And then you get, you know, the age of reason, the enlightenment, and everything is just science, and we even start to deny some of that funky stuff. I don't know what, what the right balance is, and I don't know where we are right now, and I don't know what's right. I don't know who will discipline us, but look, try and, try and have a lot of fact-based uh, uh, material in, in your stories. Try and have emotional honesty in your stories. And in the end, it will be our collective product, right, for better or for worse. And if we do well, you know, we'll all live better together. And if we do poorly, we'll all get the crap kicked out of us. <laughs> Can you talk about uh, your, yourself as a listener? Because it seems to be a, a huge part of uh, interviewing and in, in, in your show. So maybe a behind the scenes of listening, you have to hear somebody, but you're also thinking about how you're shaping. So you, you, is it bifurcating? How do you do it? What are the kind of tricks of drawing people out? But staying in the, the shaping that you're doing. I mean, what about you as a listener? This is a big, big operational deal. And this was one of the hardest things when I, when I first got into radio because, you know, uh, who, who listens that closely? So that, you know, you're always listening and you're, and you're always ready with a question. Every, every time someone shuts up, you're ready with a question. And it's a relevant, uh, you know, intriguing, uh, moving the conversation forward question. How, how on earth are you supposed to do that? I mean, you know, sometimes you just, you know, but you can't do that on the radio. Um, so I found, and I don't know if this is, uh, some people just do this naturally more easily than others. I found though that I, this sort of thing opened up, this capacity opened up, and maybe it's there for everybody, maybe like a knuckleball, some people have it more naturally than others. Um, but I found that, and this is part of that like 10.1%, you know, I, if I really got myself in that, in the zone, that I could listen and think at the same time. And I, more, more than I knew, and that's grown with time, like any muscle you use, that capacity has grown. More than you would know. I mean, remember in a studio, um, while I'm interviewing and listening to them for the heart of what they have to say, because I know everybody listening is going to be listening to whether I got, really got it or not. It's my job to like hear it as closely as anybody in the world who's listening, and ideally even a little bit better. And I'm going to be judged in every minute on that by the listeners. They're paying attention. If I miss it, they're going to say, he, he totally missed what he, she just said. So I'm listening very closely. I've, I've usually got several different questions that are sort of percolating. Um, if they say something that's that where I think the conversation's going to go, where I'd like it to go, where, where my, cu the, my curiosity or the, the sort of the, the beef or the most interesting stuff seems. So I'm leaning in that direction. Uh, I'm formulating questions that will take us further there, but I'm also listening to what they're saying now to tweak, you know, or sort of tack against that question. I'm also listening for the black swan, for the thing that they say in the midst of where I think this is going that's 
unexpected or different or, or weird. And you've got to respond to that or else you lose your listeners so he's not in it. Um, but there are other elements because, for one thing, while they're talking and I'm listening and I'm thinking of my next question, I also have a button where I can talk to my producer through the glass, um, which you won't hear on the radio. So there's this other conversation going where I say, let's pull up that tape from John Boehner yesterday afternoon and be ready to play that because I think it's going to come in here. And I'm also looking, you know, all these calls are coming in from around the country. And we've got another producer who's back there. He's saying, hi, this is on point. What do you, what do you want to say? What do you want to ask? And they're writing up little two-line summaries. You know, Jenny in Chicago says, you know, bullshit, John Boehner, uh, uh, and so on. And I see them, line, I can see half a dozen or more of them at a time. And those are also, I use those as tools, right? So, oh, look, uh, Donnie in Hazard, Kentucky, wants to say this. And if I put Donnie on, that's going to take us in a really fruitful direction. Or it's going to challenge this guest or this speaker in an interesting way. So I'm thinking about that as well. And I'm thinking about the next. It's a whole, you can see how intense it is. At the end of two hours, I feel like I just played a game of pickup basketball for, for at least an hour. I mean, it's, you're just spent, but in this really cool way, like, ah. Oh, except you're so wired, you can't have a normal conversation with anybody. You know? um, so you just get used to several tracks working at once. And then there's the sort of Uber track, which is, how are we doing overall in this conversation? Are we harvesting the value of it? Does it feel like it's connecting with listeners? Are we keeping it vital all the way along? People's attention spans, you know, are like fleas now. We always want to deliver, we always talk about the value per minute. Like in every 60 seconds, I want to hear something go out on those airwaves that's going to be like, ooh, ah, ooh, cool, interesting, oh. You know, I want to hear that again and again, not just to be freakish or, you know, not just to be flamboyant, but just real value per minute. Um, it's a matter of uh, intense focus, I guess. Print's um, different. You know, in some ways, a lot of broadcasts, certainly talk shows, there's a there's a parasitical element. I live on a sea of information that's been collected by a lot of my print brothers and sisters in arms. I mean, that packet that I get for each hour to do my research, it's full of good shoe leather reporting out in the street in Syria or in, you know, Sacra wherever, California, by, by print reporters who go out and get it. And they get, radio does a lot of great stuff, but print still brings home so much of this sort of informational, factual bacon. So when you're a print reporter, sometimes you're doing a mood piece where you're out just talking. I mean, you always, when you're interviewing, you have to establish this relationship, this quick connect relationship with whoever you're talking to. Like, I'm a print reporter. I walk up to you and I ask you, you know, when do you want to have children? And, you're, and I want a real answer from you. Well, I have to establish a relationship very quickly in print, even faster on radio. Because in print, I can kind of size you up and we can spend some time and we can go have tea and then I can work. In radio, within two minutes, I have to have you comfortable enough that I can ask you that question and you will give me something honest and open and true. Um, it seems to me that you talk about your process of making the show, because I worked for a baby news magazine for a while on a local station that was very controlled. Um, there were lots of questions, each minute was planned out, we you know, designed in advance where the questions were going to go, and as a consequence it didn't have the same vibrancy that um, Boeing has, where I feel like you are willing to go to potentially uncomfortable places to really create a moment. And that brings me to my real question, which is you are trying to create this big tent, right? Um, you're not trying to just create a false equivalency where, oh, I, just, I have someone on that might be a little left wing. I better bring someone on that might be right wing, right? You really want to tell Well, I mean, there's an element of that, but we don't, we don't want to be prisoners of that. Well, right. And so that's, that's I guess, my question. I'm just thinking um, a couple of years ago, you interviewed a woman, I think her name was Caitlin Flanagan. Girlman. She was writing this book about how like, <laughs> girls should be locked in their rooms because if they leave them, they'll lose their virginity and be exposed to sexuality and uh, she had this whole As of course they will. As they will. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know if you remember the show. Kind of. I remember Caitlin Flanagan was controversial for some reason. I don't remember the nuance of what of it, but, but you, you're kind of bringing it back. Right. What you're saying is not. You're not being reasonable. Like what you 
percent not making sense. I mean, she was too like absolute about what you. Absolute. It's like you read. Did I roll with it? Did I protest it? You become a prostitute. Like it was something. Oh, okay. Did I say, oh yeah, fine, or did I? No, you really called her on it. You were like, this, this is not. Thank God. Yeah. Like being liberal, being progressive, the way it's under attack by the right wing, I'm so frightened yeah. to really take on, on yes. I'm yeah. just wondering how you navigate that. Um, well, part of it is chauvinism, in this sense. Well, no, it, because you know, I have this sense, and you, you've all, you got it, everybody has to figure out their own sense, like where you're coming from, and it, that has supported me in this role that I grew up in a little house on the prairie, in the middle of the country, in, a, in as American a place as you can possibly be. It was not liberal. It was as churchy as you ever, it was just as American as you can imagine. So I don't care who you, you know, and this is chauvinistic and it's kind of my own little thing, but my thing is, you cannot out-American me. <laughs> you cannot, and I'm not even afraid of it. And if you try, I will flip you like a sumo dog, <laughs> right? You can't. And now I'm not saying that that, you know, that the be all and end all for every American interview has to be that you come from a little house in the prairie. They're great interviews. Look at Terry Gross, Philadelphia. But on the other hand, she does it differently, right? She does it differently. Mine's a more populist. Mine's call in. So I'm always, among everything else I'm doing, I'm always dog whistling, call me, call me, call me. You want to call me, right? But I, I, I'm not afraid to go at that stuff because I'm not, I feel like I'm not going to be revealed. You can't, you know, one of the tricks of people who want to beat down an interview is to make them the other yeah. or unworthy to ask the question or outside the real mainstream of, you know, the people who are listening to us now. You cannot do that to me. <laughs> and I'm not afraid of you doing it to me. And it just isn't going to happen. Plus, I'm not coming from a hateful place. So even when I challenge Caitlin Flanagan, I, you know, there's something to what she says, right? The, I don't know about the, I don't remember the extreme of it, but, but it is factually true. You let a daughter out of her room, out in the world, and sooner or later, she will lose her virginity. Um, so, I mean, so I, I you know, uh, I kind of know, where, you know, I'm willing to acknowledge some kernel that's in there, but then call the way she spins it, or the way she insists on, on presenting it. I, which is to say, even if I sort of violently disagree with her, I'm going to try and come respectfully toward the heart of what she's trying to get at with an opening presumption that she has some good motivation that maybe the manifestation of it is sort of like fritzing out, you know, but there's something in there that is worth hearing even if. And uh, so I, I'm, I've also found there's not much you can't talk about, you know. Uh, if, you, if you come with those, um, you know, if you come and you're secretly disdainful of women, you're going to be caught out when you're talking about women's issues. You're going to get in trouble. If you're secretly racist, that is going to be exposed sooner or later. You have to, like, really get centered uh, as a public storyteller or interviewer in the right place, or else don't, and Fox will hire you. <laughs> or MSNBC. <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I've had a grand time getting to know you in the past hour or so as um, like God is in the grass, Illinois, and John is reading about God. And now you're mocking so my God. I'm, 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 <laughs> no, that's cool. Okay. Uh, um, and then doing work in many different places in America and abroad. Um, um, as actually as someone from God is in the Grass, South Carolina, and then <laughs> Andover, um, um, have experienced some similar sort of collisions with uh, different cultures and um, ideas about what a story is and where it goes and who it's for. Um, and I was wondering if you've had any insight into what it means to tell stories across cultures, both domestically and abroad, um, and how we can do that constructively as characters in a global narrative. I mean, I, I think the, the same basic principles work, except that you both have to try harder to let down your prejudices and to open your sense of form, to, to be even more generous, more loving, 
by which I mean really respectful. But if you, I, I've never found cross-culture, I mean, in, in, a, in a speedy way, it can be too fast. It, you know, sometimes things happen so fast that you can't communicate and you're in trouble. You know, uh, I mean, the day I decided to leave newspaper journalism and go to the internet, I was in Mogadishu. I was looking, I was going for an interview with a warlord. We were making our way through the streets of Mogadishu, which were absolutely, you know, just bashed to pieces. Black Hawk Down had just happened. The helicopter blade was still laying in the sewer gutter there, they, you know. And it was so hot and it took so slow because there were things all over the streets and I fell asleep and I woke up and a guy was, something was cool and nice on my cheek. <laughs> I was in the back seat of the car, I had gunmen. I had to have gunmen to, you know, like with me. But there was a guy at a roadblock and he was waking, nudging me awake and he had, a uh, rocket propelled grenade launcher with one of these, a big orange grenade thing on the end. Looked like one of those Turkish turban gourds, you know? And he was putting it against my cheek. And I woke up, and there's no time for talking there. I just decided, I'm finished with this. Um, uh, <laughs> I got kids and a wife. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, it's, I found it even more gratifying when you do the cross cultural storytelling because you have to become more naked. Because you have to get further down toward your own kernel to find the commonality, right? Our, our robes and garments of language and culture are quite different. But if you get down far enough, they'll still, you'll still find a lot that's the same. You can't, you can't assume they're exactly like me. But if you're respectful, you can find that common ground. And once you find it, I, I always found it's, it's even more gratifying because it's like you've gone on a really funky journey to get in there. You know, you've like paid the price, a bigger price of admission to this sharing of, of, of honesty or whatever sharing it is. Um, you can do it. It just takes more, more nakedness and honesty to do it and more, more manners, more politeness because you have to respect your differences along the way and then, you know, get to the, the jewel in the middle. Uh, hmm? hey. Are there some stories that you wish you wouldn't have told? Or stories that you don't really want to tell? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's some truths that are just hard, you know. Um, after a couple of years living in Tokyo, uh, I was hearing all of these. Um, there was this new thing happening where Japan was rich and Western women were going and they were getting married in Japan. And I began to hear these stories about there's troubles in all kinds of marriages, but I was fascinated with this, like what would it be, Japan, a very insular culture? What would it be like to marry in there? You know, we, we know the, the other stories, lots of Asian women married American GIs and came to the United States. I don't know if those stories have been perfectly told. But anyway, I went out to lunch with some American women who were married to Japanese guys, and we drank wine, and they like told me all these stories about how hard it was. And I wrote that story. And then, their relatives in America read it and sent it back to Japan and all hell broke loose. I mean, they knew I was a reporter. We had lunch. They told me everything. I didn't write the most scathing story. I just pointed to some of the cultural difficulty of it. I tried to do it in a way that was not, you know, chauvinist, racist, etc. I tried it. I did it just as cleanly as I could. It was an interesting, honest story and it put their marriages in terrible peril. And they uh, had me come over to dinner with their husbands. And it was like, th th you know, it was like this. <laughs> and I was supposed to say that uh, I dreamed all that. You know, that that was, that wasn't, I got them wrong. I totally misunderstood them, which I hadn't. And it was a really, really hard night. And in retrospect, that story wasn't worth telling. You don't need to know how they feel if I have to go through that to tell you. <laughs> it was hard. Are we done or? Okay. I think we can take one more question. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone asked you earlier, what are the qualities of a storyteller? And I was wondering, how did you develop these skills and how can people develop their, these skills in like just everyday life? Um, do it a lot. The more you do, the more you'll you come to understand yourself and where you're knotted up and where you're free. And you want to be free and open and lucid. Um, you know, pay honest attention. 
um, uh, you know, look for, look for what's fascinating. Um, don't be afraid to try and communicate things that are awkward or even strange because they're often keys to really interesting insight. Listen and look carefully. You know, try and really see. You know, we all come up prisoners of all kinds of preconceptions. And to some extent, we remain prisoners all our lives. But there's a lot of preconceptions that you can shed. Some of your preconceptions will give interesting tints to your storytelling, you know, like Instagram filters. Your preconceptions will give coloration to your storytelling. But the deeper you go into it, the more lucid you want it to become, because life has plenty of color all on its own. And you want to see the honest color of things, the honest texture of things. And then if you do that and you convey it well, you'll be a great storyteller. <laughs> it's really fun to spend an hour with you. Thank you. I'm honored that you came.